What's cracking, ladies and gentlemen? 49 coming at you another community shoutcast for the OUSA Dirt League Season 2. We're loading into game number 2 of Horseman the Ruckus up against 5IP. Horseman the Ruckus can currently undefeated in the Group 2 playoffs. 5IP is probably their best competition and they will be able to take a very convincing game number 1 victory off them. So it will be interesting to see if the Horseman the Ruckus are able to 2-0 them. Dumbledore and King Killer sure as hell think so. They're, very, they're fairly cocky and 5IP, they've actually subbed out uh, Thunderfist in exchange for only. And so 5IP now running with Yoshi's little brother, as well as uh, Ghouli, formerly one of the players from uh, Bambi Rising. It'll be interesting to see what they decide to do for game number two. And we've got an immediate Viper first ban coming out from 5IP. They don't want to deal with Ken's Viper again. He was able to completely dominate Mew in the mid matchup. Uh, Patty will Broder, as, as he's called in-game. He does. He was theorizing at the side as a counter pick to the Viper. But of course it does also matter a lot on our player skill. And Ken Killer, he was able to show that he was the better mid in that particular matchup, as it was the first time I've actually seen Mule lose the mid lane very decisively in terms of CS as well as in terms of kills. And the disadvantage of the sniper is especially against the Venomancer as well as the Nyx Assassin, is if he ever gets called out by any of them, he's dead. If he gets called out with a Gale, he's dead, he can't be able to make a system down on time, Amy team specifically as it's back around. If he gets called in with a Vendetta Initiation, he's dead. Hawkshot can also fly out from UGTFO, so it's a very sniper inappropriate game. And so we're going to face a Void Band coming out as well, so another Respect Band out to Dumble D. However, Tinker is now in the pool, as well as the Tide Hunter. So this time, Tide Hunter is going to be probably going to be the first pick coming out from uh, 5 IP. But that being said, they don't want to give the Tinker away as King Killer, fantastic Tinker player up on him. He does like to go for the two points and laser, then max out the March build. But he could also go for the very aggressive build. I believe in the only other game I've seen him play Tinker was up against. It could have been Tag C. No, it might, it might have been Momentum Gaming. He went for a very early, a very early points up in the laser and missile. So three points in laser, three in missile, and then choosing to max out the March. And so that gave him much more early game power, as well as with the two points in March to ensure that he can find some farm. So in instead decides snowball off kills. And 5 IP. Broda, he's the big bad drafter. He's the one that's going to make the decisions for his team. And he's starting to sweat as he's really dipping into his, re his reserve time. He really doesn't want to give away the Tide, but he also doesn't want to give, a give away the Tinker, especially to a Radiant side horseman, the Ruckus. And he instead goes for Shadow Shaman, so they could decide to pick up Tinker and the Titan if they really want to. And that gives them two very powerful heroes, especially on the Radiant side, as Tinker has easy access to the Ancients. It's much more difficult to contest uh, Radiant Ancients than it is to contest the uh, Dire Ancients, because you've got TP Swat coming into the mid lane as well as the top lane. And you've got the fact that you can place a very easy uh, defensive ward there, they can spot out uh, the rune as well as provide information on uh, non-smoke rotations into the mid lane. And so Horseman of Ruckus sounded to deliberate as well. The Tinker could also be a bit of a bait pickup if you pick up Tinker this early on, because there are heroes that shut down Tinker very effectively. And if, because Tinker's such a greedy hero, and because he takes farm from every single uh, lane as well as the jungle, it's very difficult to uh, lose, recover a game if the Tinker is underperforming. So Tinker as well as the Titan is exactly what I thought would happen. Titan is going to be the off lane played by UGTFO and Tinker, the mid lane being played by Ken Killer. They have to invest a lot of resources to make sure that Tinker does very well in the uh, mid lanes. And Tinker has one weakness is you've got to, the only reason why it considers to be broken is that you have about a 15 minute window to be able to uh, beat the Tinker, otherwise he's going to completely destroy you. You have to gank him repeatedly in the mid lane. You have to ward off his Ancients, maybe even ward off his jungle to ensure, or clear his stacks if he does, if his sports stack in the jungle. And then, since you have to buy as much time as possible for your team to be able to uh, get their farm up before Tinker gets Boots of Travels and before he gets his Boots of Travels Blink Dagger, because once he gets those two items up, it is very difficult to gank Tinker unless you have specific heroes that are able to provide, provide flying vision as well as close the distance against the Tinker. And so, for instance, you've got the Storm Spirit, they can zip in the trees, and Ball Lightning also makes you invulnerable to the damage coming up from the march. But if the game goes late enough, Tinker will be able to destroy the Storm Spirit. Once he gets the Dagon e play combo up, he can actually blow up the uh, Storm Spirit or blink out before the Storm Spirit is able to grab him. But then instead, go for Death Prophet. To Death Prophet, also a fairly effective Tinker uh, counter in the sense that she could take all your towers before Tinker gets his uh, farm up and before he's able to defend. The disadvantage of the uh, Death Prophet is a Death Prophet v Tinker matchup is Tinker has fairly good base damage and since he usually almost always starts with the Nell Talisman, it gives him enough base damage to be able to contest CS against the Death Prophet. This Death Prophet has a horrible front swing, I think 0.6 front swing for her right click. And while she does have high base damage, she's reliant on her high base damage to be able to uh, get CS or the Crypt Swarm. And so she does have the Crypt Swarm to control the lane, which is something Tinker doesn't have. He's got the laser, which you probably will be investing two points into. But Tinker v Death Prophet, Death Prophet has a slight edge. Since he could, since Death Prophet should be able to have rune control, but if the sports from Horseman the Ruckus are able to deny Death Prophet those runes, then Tinker is, is able to break even and he's able to control, uh, win control the lane. Since with the laser, it's very difficult to stay in lane up against a Tinker, so he just constantly throws at the laser. He uses the march to push you back. And we've got a third bad Clockwork Goblin coming up from Horseman the Ruckus. So because they've picked up Titan, they don't want to give the clock away to 5 IP. And 5 IP, Patty banning out the uh, Skyrath Mage. It'll be interesting to see what his fourth ban is. 
Since they've picked up the Shadow Shaman for now, Shadow Shaman, very powerful support hero, if a bit greedy, that's the only drawback with the hero. If you want him to be effective in terms of ganking in the lane, you want him to start with Boots first, so you can guarantee the Shackle. But when you start with Boots first on one of your support heroes, that means the other support hero has to pick up the slack, and that means that if you're not able to achieve kills with the early Boots up in the Shadow Shaman, then he starts to taper off since you have to get a fair amount of golden experience for the Shadow Shaman to be effective. You want him to get level 6, level 7 ASAP, and you want him to get Arcane Boots, and then maybe build a Blink Dagger in the later stages of the game, since it gives him that initiation power so he can hang back in the fights instead of being uh, called out in the initial salvo of the initiation. Nature's Prophet, bad coming out from Horseman the Ruckus, as Nature's Prophet in the 1v1 offlane does very well against the Titan 2. Since Titan Hunter excels against 1v1 melee matchups, where he could use the Anchor Smash to bully them in the landing uh, to kill CS. Nature's Prophet as a ranged hero, and a ranged hero, hero with su uh, surprisingly high base damage can actually contest CS very well against a Tide Hunter. And then you always have that split pushing capability since Nature's Prophet, not too bad of a tanker hunter since he could use the Wrath of the. Uh, Nature's call to be to clear out the trees, and you can always global teleport into where he thinks the Tinker might be blinking into, since one of the things that you have to learn when you're playing against the Tinker is where he's going to be blinking into, since Tinker will always shift key the blink when he's BOTing to a creep wave, and so usually is a number of spot, a predefined spot that he's going to blink to in order to ensure that he doesn't get caught out the gank. But if you know where he's blinking to, if you can catch him out, then Tinker becomes food. And if you can kill Tinker outside of his base, then you can end the game before, or at least force Tinker to buy back and try to get farm up on your heroes, since the tanker pickup will be depriving farm from every other hero on Horseman the Ruckus, and so they're going to be de dependent on kill gold, or on being able to take towers, since tanker also can split push, and we've got a silencer band coming up from 5 IP, Barretta does really does not want to play against a silencer again, especially after game number 3 up against weed unit, Brewmaster pickup coming up from 5 IP, so we could actually be seeing an off a solo offlane death prophet up against the tide hunter, and a Brewmaster mid, Brewmaster in the mid lane, he has a very difficult time against the Tinker, just because as a melee hero, he always is going to be, he has to be, uh, be wary of the march. Since Tinker can throw out marching machines to be able to control creeps and ensure that he's able to get the rune. And since uh, Brewmaster is a melee hero, he can't go anywhere near the creep wave when the march flies out. He has to hang back, and so it makes it difficult for him to find CS. But that being said, if Brewmaster is able to hit 6 very quickly, he can act the instant he hits level 6, Tinker's dead. Uh, once he drops the primal, he doesn't even have to get in range for the clap, he can just primal and go in for a kill there. And he should be able to secure the kill up on the Tinker. And so Tinker has to uh, respect the power of the Brewmaster and try to shut him down as much as possible. So it could be, we could be seeing Mule up on the uh, mid lane Brewmaster, or we could actually be seeing an off lane Brewmaster. The drawback with the off lane Brewmaster is he only works against soft tri lanes. If the tri lane's uh, aggressive enough to be able to go for a kill attempt on the Brewmaster, then Brewmaster tapers off very effectively. Uh, because you have to get Blink, uh, you have to get Arcane Boots first to ensure that you have enough mana for the Blink and Split and uh, Blink Clap Split combo. And then you want the Blink Dagger to ensure that you get a clap off. Since Brewmaster, you want to clap before you split. Since if you can land the clap on multiple heroes, it makes it very easy for your CC rotation to come out. Since the Earth Panda, you stun one with the Boulder, you immediately tap, and then you cycle up the other using the Wind Panda. So you want to cycle out, in this case, the Abaddon. So Abaddon can't save anybody. And we've got an Abaddon pickup coming up for Horseman of Ruckus. Every single game in Abaddon has been picked up. It has actually been a one position Abaddon. So, and Dumble D has actually run a core position Abaddon before. Abaddon is actually a very powerful uh, core position hero because of the fact that he could just YOLO dive and just straight up trade the hit last hit, so he doesn't really give a damn if he gets low because he's always got that borrowed time. And because Abaddon is such a, a nuisance because of the uh, excellent time on target he has, since he'll be having phase boots as well as the Curse of Avernus, you can't run away from the big bad Nazgul, he'll be able to run you down. He actually is very powerful uh, call hero in taking these early fights, because he just runs at your backline heroes. He runs at the Shadow Shaman. Shadow Shaman can't do anything to the Abaddon. If he shackles him, then the Tinker just blows him up with the laser rocket. Titan just throws out the Ravage. If you don't shackle him, he can always Ephotic Shield whoever you are shackling, or whoever you hex. And he just runs at you, because he's got the borrowed time. So he knows that there's nothing he can do. The only thing the Shadow Shaman can reliably do is turn into a chicken to run the hell the other way. And when you're wasting your hex on the Abaddon, who's going to be back in the fight anyway, it means that you're wasting a lot of time. Uh, you're, lot, you're wasting a lot of resources that could be going towards controlling the Tinker or controlling the Tidehunter. The Tidehunter is going to be guaranteed to be able to get very easy uh, either counter initiates or initiates off. So that's the advantage of the Tidehunter. The reason why he's currently the most powerful offlane here in the game is he works very well either aggressively if you get a good Blink Ravage off on the enemy team, if you're able to catch up their backline, you can win that fight off the back of the Ravage. Or defensively, since if they go in, if uh, Brewmaster blinks and the rest of the team follow up to try to kill the Tinker, Bruma, a Tidehunter just throws out the Ravage. If he's able to catch out uh, the uh, advancing enemy team, that also spells doom for your team, since Abaddon's also a fantastic counter-initiator with the Aphotic Shield. And we've got a Rubik pickup coming up from 5 IP. Rubik does a lot of work against this particular lineup, because you can steal the Titan to Ravage, so if Rubik's able to get a Blink Dagger, and if he can steal and return that Ravage, you could turn the entire fight around off the back of that. Navi's Kuroki, famous for me to do that, as well as Dendi himself, back when Rubik used to be a mid-viable hero. Now, not so much. Rubik actually is a very weak support hero, you only ever pick him as a counter-pick, or unless you have a specific setup, and you don't have access to the Bane Elemental or the Shadow Demon. 
since Rubik, what he lacks is damage. He provides you a, a huge amount of control since he could uh, lift people up, so not only does he stun them, he can also reposition them, so it makes it very easy for abilities such as the Arid Land. But the drawback of the Rubik is he's slow, he's squishy, he needs a fair amount of gold experience, and he doesn't really do much damage. And so Shadow Shaman, he makes up for that because the Ether Shock is a very cost efficient spell. But at the same time, Shadow Shaman, because he's going to be spending the majority of the time in these, one in these uh, ganks using the Shackle, you don't really have much damage coming out from 5 IP. So you really have to rely on your core heroes then to be able to provide the damage in these ganks. Lion Band coming out has lines of fantastic counter to the Brewmaster with that 4 second instant hex. So when Brewmaster blinks in to go for the clap, you hex him. If you're facing the Brewmaster and Brewmaster blinks in front of you, you can immediately hex him before he gets any of his spells off. And then Brewmaster's dead. Every time Brewmaster does not get a successful promise split, you lose the fight. And losing a fight with the lineup that 5 IP had, it's entirely dependent on death balling. They have to win every single fight, or uh, even if they win only by a little, they have to win these fights so they can take towers. And if they're unable to win these fights and take the towers, then they, their lineup falls behind. Now, towards some of the Ruckus, they've got the, the best late game hero in the game, they've got the Tinker. It's almost impossible to breach high ground against the Tinker that plays effectively, because once he has a Blink Dagger, he blinks out of your Blink Initiation range and starts spamming the March. And so the march uh, is timed so it lands just outside of the tower wave, so when the creep wave pushes up, they'll be walking through the march, and so by the time they uh, get to high ground and have vision of your base, they're already dead or almost dead. And so you, you don't know where the tinker is, first of all, so he could be sitting anywhere, and, and you also have the fact that he's always throwing out missiles, and so your hero is constantly taking a lot of uh, chip damage. Bristleback being banned out, and the off chance that, that it's going to be a safe lane Brewmaster, since Bristleback actually does very well against this uh, soft tri lane, because you've got the Ancient Apparition, who actually doesn't have any reliable lockdown, Cold Feet needs to set up spell, and if Abandon's going to be another support hero, then he doesn't have any uh, lockdown at all. Abandon, he's a purely defensive support hero. It's the reason why you usually see him as a core position when he's picked up, and it's because while you can run him as a support hero, he only he doesn't really work too well because you need levels in him, and he can't rotate. He can only rotate defensively, so that's why uh, Abandon's very rarely picked up. You can use him as a counter pick in certain heroes, such as the Bat Rider, if you're able to get your Aphotic Shield off as he lassoes. Before he gets the Skyhook combo with the Blink of the Four Star, then Abandon works very well against certain matchups, or against the Mirana. If the hero takes an error, you shield them, you turn around, you kill the Mirana. So we're going to be seeing a core position in the Madden with the Sand King as the uh, final support pickup. Ancient Apparition Sand King, not the greatest support duo. Sand King will be forced to go for boots in this particular uh, support duo if he wants to be effective. Since without the boots, it's very easy for the enemy heroes to be able to uh, get out of the way before Sand King can close the distance to get that bar strike. Razor as the final pickup, so we're going to be seeing Wolf Cut once again on the Razor. So far, 0% win rate, so two games in the Razor, it's the third game now. Let's see if he can break that spree. Method Man going to be playing that Sand King. Probably going to be uh, stacking up the jungle a lot, making good use of that to get a very early arcade boot or very early Blink Dagger. Let's see if he can get some good ultimates off, but otherwise, Jamie, please try to land a good epic send while the camera's on you. And Mule going to be the mid lane Death Prophet, so they are going to be sending uh, Broden to the off lane. So Broden going to be the Brewmaster this time, with only, as well as uh, Ghoulie going to be the to her. So I believe Ghoulie will be playing the Shadow Shaman, and only Yoshi's little brother going to be playing that Rubik. And so Wolfgang going to be the safe lane farmer up on that Razor, so with the. Uh, Shadow Shaman raises an absolutely fantastic combo because Shackle ensures that you're able to get a good standard link off. And if you get a good standard link off, you kill everybody. There's no hero that can stand against a raise that gets a good link off. Just because he steals such an obscene amount of damage. Over for Horseman the Ruckus, King Killer going to be the mid lane as the uh, Tinker. Actually choosing to hold on to his gold, so not going with a completed Null Talisman. Tanker players do this if they think they're going to be having a fairly easy lane, or if they think the hero that they're up against, they should have the damage advantage. So that ensures that they could get their, uh, soul ring, uh, their bottle and soul ring up a lot faster. Dumble Knee going to be the safe lane abandon, starting with Quilling Blade. And he's one of those carry players that's able to get every single CS in lane if he's uncontested. If he is contested, they actually have a fairly powerful uh, lane that could uh, turn around and counter-initiate on the enemy team. They don't have the initial pickoff power unless a Method Man looks like he's not selling on boots. So he's actually going to be fairly irrelevant until he's able to find a, f a fair amount of levels. So you need level 2, level 3, uh, you need level 3 or level 4 barrel strike to get a reliably initiate as the Sand King on his own. Unless you're able to get very early boots up and have the boots advantage over the enemy. And Gats looks like he's the one going to be selling the Observer Ward. Uh, Sand King selling with the Sentry as well as the Smoke. And so they want to D-Ward, the safety ward coming out from Broder to deprive him as much vision as possible and shut him down. So the Dire offlane is a very difficult time. Actually, they look like they swap. So Broder's going to be the uh, support position Rubik, and Ghoulie going to be the offlane Brewmaster. So 5 IP, mixing things up a little bit. And double knee with that Cling Blade and the Abandon. If he's up against the Brewmaster, he should be able to out-CS the Brewmaster fairly effectively. Brewmaster, with the... Uh, he actually chose to go for a point clap because he's the offlaner. If you're the solo laner, if you're against a 1v1 matchup, you usually go for a point the Drunken Brawler, similar to ensure that you're able to get a lot of farm. But Dumble with a higher base damage point, and with Abandon's fairly good animation, and the Quelling Blade, he should be able to have enough damage to be that out CS the Remaster if he's left alone. And it looks like that's what they're doing, they decided to go for a tri lane, uh, ties into with the UGTFO rotating to the top lane with a very early magic stick up on him. You usually don't see a very early magic stick pickup unless it's against a particular matchup, so if you get into a Bristleback or a Bat Rider, then you start with stick at 1, otherwise not worth it. And Mule, the reason why he's playing so defensively is Horseman the Ruckus, they do this almost every game, they always go for a level 1 gank. 
And Mule's actually exposed himself, and so they can decide to go for this if they decide to commit mid, but they need Mule to put, move a bit closer together, uh, closer towards the edge of the ramp, so he has to be around there. If he's hanging around where he is, he can immediately back off when they come in from this side. This is Sand King, he doesn't have enough points, or he doesn't have boots as well to be at a closer distance to so get that bar strike off. And smoke's actually broken, Mule immediately backs away, and that's a waste of a smoke as well as a two supports time. And so Dumbledore in the bot lane, he's actually forced to fence for himself, it's actually a dual lane coming out. With Ghoulie being given support from Broda to ensure that he's able to find his farm, since that's the biggest drawback with the Brewmaster, you have to end the game in 35 minutes. You've got one of the most powerful teamfight heroes for the first 35 minutes, but once they're 35 minutes up, once BKB starts to come online, and once carries get enough base damage, that they can just right-click down your uh, pandas, then he starts to become very irrelevant. Broda lifts him up, he's like a lot of creep aggro damage though, and Double D, he doesn't really give a damn, he's got the aphotic shield. Now, the Abaddon is one of the most difficult heroes to kill if he's played well, just because he can always deny himself the miscoil if he's very experienced and if you're able to get the timing right. And with the Aphotic Shield, it gives you a huge buffer of HP. It doesn't seem like much, and it's only about 110 damage at level 1 that you absorb and return back. But it's the fact that you're returning the damage back to the uh, both heroes at Ganku is what makes it quite dangerous. And Mule in the mid lane has actually been quite handily out CS. So while the level 1 gank completely failed, the upside of it is it forced Mule to play very passively. And so that man that can kill it gets a free wave of experience. This is what you do if you have a Shadow Fiend to ensure that he gets that first wave of uh, experience. And it looks like Tank is going for a very aggressive build. Two points in the laser, one point in the missile. King Killer, he's not one flying passive. He likes to play hyper aggressive. It's his trademark. It's also his biggest flaw since sometimes he overextends. Mule, much more patient player. He tries not to make any mistakes, and that's usually his trademark. He plays very safe, and he's very consistent. So you've got the skilled mid player up against the smart mid players. The one that doesn't make mistakes against the one that goes for pretty crazy uh, aggressive players. Gats actually topped the lift up in the air, but the air is there, Felix, on the clap actually completely whips from Ghoulie. And so he wastes a good chunk of his money. He can't afford to waste money as a brewmaster. Even if the clap only costs 90 mana, it, because of the, your limited mana pool is the only thing that balances the hero out. Since clap is such a powerful ability, you want to make sure that you're able to consistently land your abilities. But it looks like a bit of miscommunication coming out, as only in the top lane, Shackle up on him to ensure that if you do TFO even spotted out, Wolfcut we are guaranteed to be able to get 3-4 procs of the static link, and that could be enough to turn around for a kill, especially with the boots advantage. Each TFO, he now has his own boots picked up, and that magic stick very early on isn't really doing all too much, would have actually preferred to see a boots rush on the Titan, so boots at 1, with the safety ward as well as a few stats. And Yuji TFO, he's playing much more at defensive with his safety ward, so he's placing it in a spot that's going to be unusual for it to be D ward. Unfortunately, Ghouli uh, only actually has placed in the right position, but he just isn't aware that the safety ward's there. So until he moves forward, he might actually not even know that the safety ward is there, since he was assuming it to be around this area. So that's the reason why you never want to place your safety ward there. That's the most common spot, and that's usually where the uh, enemy supports will be to place their safety ward. As it looks like, it looks like Brother actually went for a, the greedy pub ward we placed it there. Never mind, he actually didn't place one at all. He actually placed one there. So that provides rune vision, it's very difficult to D ward, so that's a fantastic ward coming out from him. Uh, Method Man, since he's the one of the sentries, he was expecting it to be over there. Or over there, since these are the most uh, common safety ward spots for the offlaner. That's why you usually want to place the hair, since that also blocks the pull cab, or here. So that you want to make sure that you're able to waste the, uh, the sentries from the support heroes. And also mind game them out, so if, they, if you fake them out with a ward they don't know the ward's there, then every time, then so long as you have that safety ward, it's very difficult to kill you. So we've got pings coming out, as this camp's actually been blocked? Oh, never mind, it's not been blocked, no. I believe this ward actually, yeah, this ward actually blocks off that hard camp though, so that's the added benefit of it. But the drawback is when you go for a ward that gives you vision as well as blocking, is it's usually fairly obvious to spot out where it is. Mule taking a lot of damage, and King Killer with two points up the lasers whilst the missile. If he gets a right click and then follows up with the laser missile, he actually gets, that's a free kill over a Death Prophet. So I don't think uh, Mule's aware that King Killer's chosen to level up points in the missile. But he could probably assume that uh, Tinker has gone for points in March, but that, that being said, he doesn't want to uh, push the wave forward when he doesn't have to, and so he could just be holding on to his March. A lot of Tinker players actually hold on to their skill points until they absolutely need them. Double D is actually very low, he's got to be very careful. If he gets caught out with a lift into the clap, that will be his death. Since Method Man won't be the closest distance in time to be able to uh, get that burst strike off with Abaddon, going towards the Armlet Medigian, fantastic pickup on the Abaddon, since Armlet's a great pickup on strength carries in general, because it gives you such a, a great bang for your buck, it's very cost efficient, since it gives you 25 strength, so 475 HP at the press of a button, it does take about 0.7 seconds for it to tick in, but it'll, it gives you the damage, it gives you the attack speed, and it also gives you the armor, which is what a hero like a band sorely lacks. And it looks like it was just an efficiency buy, he bought it for a few seconds, just to provide that regen, and he sells it. Dumbledore does this a lot, he usually buys the ring of uh, health before he does that, but the early phase which is the band also very powerful, especially since he's going for the uh, maxed out Fodic Shield, maxed out Curse of Vanus build. So if he ever gets that first hit, and he can just run them down. Broda has nothing. Dumbledore, if he had borrowed time, he could turn, but he's going back away, he's playing very carefully. Gats is trying to go for the body block, unfortunately, well, not able to get it, and first blood falls. Over in favor of 5 IP. Method Man, Jamie completely whiffs the bar strike. 
And Gas now called out the Shackle, is also going to be taking a fall. Great plays coming up from 5 IP as the rotation from only ensures that kill. And Method Man completely whiffs that bar strike and ensures that his carry dies as well as it gets. So the dual lane from 5 IP turns into a pseudo tri lane with the rotation from only and they're able to get two kills. So things are looking good for 5 IP this time around. 300 gold lead just because in terms of CS, the Radiant side calls still do have a lot more farm. But about 900 EXP lead, which is much more important. Usually TFO called out with the Anchor, uh, catches a Wolf Gun on the Anchor Smash. Does take a one tick of the Static Storm, of the Static Link. Iron Storm once again up on Wolf Gun. He seems to really like going for Iron Storm very early on. I highly disagree with this. You want to go for, uh, uh, you need earlier points up in the Plasma Field if you want to be relevant. So the advantage of not going for the Iron Storm is you could go, unless you go for the 4-2-1 build to two points in the uh, Static Link as soon as possible. One point in the Plasma Field at two. Then you uh, go for you want to max out uh, plasma field as per usual, but at level six you get a point in the unstable current, and so that gives you a good balance of offense and defense. Since if you're playing one v one, you use the static link. So two points of static link gives you enough damage to be able to uh, ensure that you have the CS advantage, which is why you go for two points as opposed to maxing it out. And plasma field gives you the huge, uh, gives you a massive increase in burst damage. Usually TFO put up link, force use ravage defensively. If he had a T, he actually could have TP'd out of there. He would have just barely had enough time. Now caught up with the shackle. The other storm is able to clean him up. If he uh, ravaged right as he, if he TP'd right as he ravaged, he just would have had enough time to get TP out of there. But unfortunately, since he didn't time it perfectly, the ravage doesn't give me enough stun time for him to ensure that he gets a TP off otherwise. And that meant that Broly could have lifted him or only could have gone for a shackle. So good rotation coming up from 5 IP. They know that they can't stay in the bottom lane, up against that tri lane. Since they're, and they, so they still want to shut down that usually TFO to ensure that Wolfcon's having a good time as well. They want to make sure that they're able to uh, win their core position lanes. And Ghoulie, he, now he's got his primal split. He can be left alone. Ghoulie actually opting for phase boots. If Bambi, your captain, could see you now, he absolutely hates phase boots. And the rationale behind it is Brewmaster, you need money to be able to use your spells. You always want to throw off a drunken haze as well as two claps and that primal split. You never want to uh, find yourself in a position where you couldn't get a kill because you didn't have that extra mana for a clap because you used it for the drunken haze. And if you go for phase boots, like you see right now, he just barely has enough mana to use his clap and a split. You yeah, probably actually caught out the laser rocket from here from King Killer. They went for a rotation in the mid lane, but King Killer unfortunately is going to be taking a fall. He wants to get the march before he died, but Broda actually zaps him down. So he's not too happy after getting them more. He's able to clean him up, and King Killer immediately pings up uh, the ancients. He's saying that's been warded off. He actually he's got his uh, the stack up, but because he went for the aggressive build, because he wasn't able to get any kills, the aggressive build coming up from Tinker actually opted for uh, three points in the March Machine. So this is a very, very old school Tinker build. This is a Tinker build that used to happen about two years ago. We go for two points in Laser and two points in March to give yourself a very good uh, laning phase and to give yourself a bit of kill potential if the enemy team uh, can rotate on you. And then you want to max out the March. And so the rationale behind it is it gives you a good mix of offense and defense. Since it means that if you go for a, a March build, every time your March is down, you've only got the Laser to rely on. And that doesn't give, that doesn't give you much killing power. And the supports can simply wait out the uh, march, and once the march is on call, then they can rotate in for a kill, and Tinker isn't able to do anything. It means you also can't rotate, as all you're doing is, all you're really going to be able to do is farm. And so the advantage of this build is it gives you that good uh, mix, so if he does commit to a gank, or if he does happen to find himself being ganked, he could at least try to turn it around. But the drawback of this build is because you don't have that early point in rearm, it's going to take you a very long time to be able to clear out the ancients, as opposed to if you went for rearm at 6, if you went for the traditional 2-3-1 uh, build with the soul ring. It gives you a 2 0 3 1 build. It gives you enough the uh, comeback recovery of being a constantly used to rearm. King Killer caught off the plasma field. Brody's coming from the side. Once again, he takes a fall. And 5 IP showing they aren't afraid of the tanker. As they're able to pick him off. And they're taking time on the tanker, being delayed. Especially if they're able to farm the ancients as well. So 5 IP, they're exploiting uh, tanker's big. Take his uh, advantage of the ancients by being a clearing up for themselves. So that gives them a huge influx of gold at expense of the enemy carry. But the drawback to this is Dumbledore, he's been having an absolutely fantastic time in bottom lane. Despite that, his first death, he still is leading the CS scoreboards. And the thing with Abaddon is he can make space for your tanker. He can uh, hold the line. Since once he gets the uh, armlet Medigian up, looks like he's going for... He could actually be going for phase of the Drum. Phase of the Drum also is a very effective build because it gives you the maneuverability to go for these kills. Brother steals what looks like a uh, level 2 cold feet. Gats really likes to go for maxing out cold feet as opposed to the chilling touch, even though chilling touch gives you more damage. The only advantage of the maxed out cold feet build is if you have a support hero that can reliably set up the cold feet, then it's worthwhile because it gives you a lot more lockdown. But even then, because cold feet costs so much mana, maxing out the chilling touch gives you a lot more overall DPS, so it lets you kill them much quicker. So for instance, if you have an ancient apparition and 
a Nagasari, not Ancient Apparition, and Ogre Magi. It's with the Ignite as well as the Fire Blast. You can, that, if you combo them perfect, perfectly, you get enough stun and CC time to ensure that you get the Cold Feet off. Then maxing out the Cold Feet gives you a lot of solo killing power. But Yushi TFO hides to the trees. He's got Ravage online, so they don't want to dive. This is only taking a few tower hits. Shadow Shaman's a very squishy support hero, so if he was continuing to eat that tower, if they continue to dive, he could turn around that Ravage and at least make it a trade, but being able to get a kill over and only. Special supports ready, willing, and able to rotate. Sand King level 5, level 6, gonna be out very soon. Looks like he's farming up. A, he's got enough money for his boots as well as the magical one. Has whipped his only uh, bar strike in the game, so his only action so far has unfortunately been in vain. Take care, opting for a point in uh, rearm now because he knows he's playing from behind. So you want to go for that value point in rearm to ensure that you, it doesn't mitigate your, uh, it doesn't slow down your farm speed. So when you're playing from behind as a tinker, you you're gonna be relying on March Machine Spam to be able to ensure that you can find your farm. And so the sports that really have to be stacking up these camps for him. None of these camps are stacked up. When you're playing with a tinker, you either, you stack ancients and you stack the other camps. That's the only camp that's been stacked through, but there has been no double pull through from these two camps. And so I'm not really too sure what the sports have really been up to. They were able to... Actually, they haven't been able to do anything at all. Yeah, no, they haven't even gone for a rotation yet. It's 5 OP that's been rotating. So yeah, the ancient apparition and the sand king, this is the disadvantage of the sand king. It's because sand king isn't, hasn't really been clearing out the jungle. I suppose he might, he actually might have been clearing out the jungle in the own time since he got 15 CS. So he's cleaned up some jungle CS. He really has been uh, fairly ineffective so far. If you're playing a Sand King, you want to go for kills, or you want to hang back and farm, or you want to do a mixture of both. So Sand King, hang around at the lane level 1 with boots first, you can get that early first player with the bar strike, be able to catch him off guard. And then once you pick up level 2, level 3, you start rotating into the jungle. Method Man, toss him to the air by Broder, but unfortunately no kill power coming up from them. They've got that ward up, and unfortunately the Sentry thought it would be going there. And so the Sentry just barely out of range, so great recognition coming up from 5 IP, placing it there instead. So they know that this is the most common uh, ward spot coming up from the dire side, for both sides, as a defensive or an offensive ward. And so usually you place a sentry ward there, in case they've also placed the ward there as well, to be able to spot out any rotations, or if they're placing their rune ward there. And so good recognition coming out from 5 IP, mind gaming out the support, and that wastes a sentry, and that wastes a lot of time, since the longer that ward is up, the more difficult it is for Kin. Since every time he goes in for the ancient tag, although he's got his 500 gold off his boots of travel, so they go for a kill attempt now, it can be an absolute disaster. Bro, they're caught up with the bar strike, he's gonna be a retaliatory kill, and King Killer actually gets a fair amount of gold, never mind, it actually looks like Sand King smacks that open. Only doesn't have to mess up once so he backs off. Yushi TFO does have to ravage online. Doesn't want to use it only on one target though. And only fleeing for his life. Caught up with the gush. The gypsy spit coming up from the Titan. And the bow strike this time lands from Method Man. He's able to land this time. Bow strike fly out. Uh, the ravage flies out. Kept up Mule's Wolf Wolfcock. Mule pops his uh, exorcism. That pops off the bar in time. Wolfcock caught up with the laser as well as the gush. And Method Man, he's still a bow strike available. So he should be using it to go for a kill. Actually, Death Prophet cleans up Tinker. So it delays his boots of travels by a little bit. Method Man fleeing as Mule's got that haste rune, he's coming at you, he's bottling up, will come flee for his life, UGTFO does have the gush available, so he can use that to go for a kill, he spits him in the face and brings him down, and the tide gets another kill, Gax eats the uh, Crypt Swarm to the face, one more Crypt Swarm will be enough for the kill, but he doesn't have enough mana, he actually smokes at the Panic Smoke coming from him, one more right click and the Spirit Damage should be enough, never mind, the Spirit's backed off as the Exorcism wore off, and Gax just barely keeps himself alive, a Aphotic Shield stolen by the Rubik, that is a very critical spell to steal, since the only drawback of the Aphotic Shield, is a band's cast point. He's got about 0.5 cast point. Rubik has zero cast point on any spell that he steals. He's actually got zero cast point in general. And so Rubik stealing any spell uh, from the enemy team is absolutely fantastic because he doesn't have to deal with the cast point. That's why if the enemy team picks up an Omni Knight, you pick up a Rubik. You steal any one of his spells and they're game breaking. Purification with zero cast point is balls out overpowered. Don't even talk, don't get me started on the Repel or the Guardian Angel. And so Rubik is a great counter pick up against the Abandon for that reason. And Brewmaster Ghoulie went for Phase Drum. This is a very, very old school build in the Brewmaster. Before Blink had zero mana cost, you used to go for this back when Blink cost 75 mana. And that was because if you went for a very early Blink, you wouldn't have enough mana to be able to execute your combo. Dumbledore actually is borrowed times off. He's very low. Ghoulie can actually decide to go for this. And he runs in with a split and then pops the uh, Primal Split. He could go for a kill over in the Abandon. Chooses not to chance it. And Dumble D with the treads up on him, probably gonna be going towards. Yeah, he goes for the Vladimir's offering. Vladimir's offering a great pickup on the abandon, because it gives you everything you need. It gives you armor, which you lack. It gives you the mana regen, which you need as an abandon. Even if you're playing a core position abandon, just because you do choose through a fair amount of mana. And it gives you that sweet, sweet uh, da uh, lifesteal as well as damage aura, which is very effective for the rest of your team. Since it means that you can also function as a bit of a. You're providing a bit of utility for your team. Mask of Madness also is very good on the Abandon because he's because you have that borrow time, you have a get out of jail freak out. Wolf can't call out with the bar strike, Method Man lands it again this time. So after that first miss, he's been catching him, but he's still there in Sandstorm. Could have actually gone for the epicenter, he actually should have gone for the epicenter there. That would have been a kill up on Wolf Gun. 
and he just turns around with the Iron Storm, he backs away, only is also there waiting in the wings, he doesn't have to mash up and watch, he goes into the shackle, new TFO, losing a lot of armor, Mega Man, now he goes in for the episode, the episode that comes out, he dies as he gets it off, it only brings him down, but he, it's a trade for a trade, support for support, new TFO runs back forward, and Broda with the, uh, Iphonic Shield keeps Wolfgun alive, episode being stolen every turn by Broda, fantastic plays coming up for the Rubik, Ken Cole pops the invisibility room, fleeing for his life, Dumbledore D shields himself up, says, buddy, you took my ability, he comes in for a kill, but there's two heroes still up there, both of the cores. Wolfcut was able to survive through all of that because of the mech and because of the assistance coming out from Broda as well as Wolfcut. And they're able to turn around. Wolfcut looks like he's got his Yule Scepter uh, almost up. He's about 250 gold off that. And Dumbledore, Phase, Orb of Venom, and probably wants to be finishing his uh, Drums of Endurance to give himself that extra movement speed. So it gives him about 500 movement speed with the Phase up and with the Curse. And with Curse of Venom, so it's a uh, haste run basically, since you've always got 522 movement speed. Ancient Apparition, level 7, almost level 8, and only is able to pick up level 6 by killing Jamie. So, Epicenter being committed to kill a support, as opposed to Wolfcut. If they used it on Wolfcut, they would have had enough damage to kill him, or if they, they would have brought him down low enough that Yuji TFO can feel comfortable when committing the Ravage. But unfortunately, he wasn't able to do so, and he got the Epicenter stolen as well, with Broda being under return. So, fantastic plays coming out from Broda. He gave his life up for that Epicenter, but it's more than worth it, because we get a fair amount of damage to secure another kill. Can kill a club with a grave silence. Ancient apparition, ice plus flies off, eclipse garter. If it hit brother full on, that would have been enough for a kill. And the band actually gets a kill on the top lane as he just straight up dives. He's got the borrowed time. He's got the aphotic shield. He doesn't really give a damn. And method man able to soak up a much needed uh, inflex of golden spells experience. Level eight up on him. He's got the arcane boots up, and he's about almost a third of the way to his blink dagger. Once he gets that blink dagger, Sand King becomes very very scary. But it's always an issue of when he gets that blink dagger. And Ghoulie, he actually hasn't been rotating at all. I don't know what. This Blue Master has been uh, accomplishing. He's been sitting there in the offlane. He hasn't been going for kills. He hasn't used Primal Split once. Every time Primal Split is up, that's a free kill and potentially a free tower with the line for 5 IP. You have to be able to take advantage of this. Because the later the game goes, Blue Master become very irrelevant po uh, post 35 minutes. Especially against an abandoned if Abandon ever picks up a BKB, you can't cycle him up, so he's always going to be the shield off whoever you bother toss. And he actually could be taken forward and I might be forced to commit the uh, Primal Split to keep himself alive. Never mind the Drunken Brawl keeping me alive. As a double, he actually missed three hits in a row, and so RNG Jesus from Ghoulie. But because he's going to be picking up a very late blink digger, by 17 minutes you usually have Arcane Blink, and you're halfway towards your item scepter if you're having a good game. Gat once again cleaned up on a Death Prophet, and Mule, despite losing the CS uh, wall in the mid lane, actually he's, he's beating King Killer for CS now, he's actually recovered very nicely. Boots of Travels now up for Tinker, but he's a thousand gold off his uh, blink digger, only commits a ward very early on, he's actually caught up the barrister, he feeds. He is able to get that tower, at least able to get to 9, never mind, you missed Micros. So he throws away his life as well as his wards, you never want to do this, you only commit the wards if you can get a kill, if you can get a tower. Primal Split be committed over on Dumbledore. there has to be a cycle up on Method Match, and sure he can't come in for the uh, retaliation, but Dumble D, Borrowed Time was used, he's now he's cycling down, he's the wrong target to cyclone. And when he, when his Borrowed Time is down, when his Borrowed Time is up, then you cyclone him so he can't save his teammates, but when his Borrowed Time is down, yeah, that's the wrong target because that's going to give him enough time to uh, drop another Aphonic Shield. Ancient Apparition Ice Blast cleans up, Mule Yushi taking it very well, he drops a Ravage over on four heroes, he kills Broda in the back line, and Wolfcut also caught out the Barrister, great Barrister on two, Method Man unfortunately feeds his life away as the Iron Storm cleans him up, Wolfcut unfortunately doesn't have enough mana to be able to use the uh, Plasma Field, Haste Room being picked up by Ghoulie, it looks like Mule's picking it up, so Ghoulie's picked up, he wishes he had a Blink Dagger for that, Yushi TFO, Jukes, he just hides in the trees and fantastic, Jukes coming out from him, taking the back line, kills off only once again, who died once, came back alive, TP back in the mid lane, then died again, very close and brutal game coming out from both teams, as the throw is coming out from 5 IP, turn gold lead back in favor of Horseman Arrakis. Wolfgun TPing out the Kofi, might probably time, never mind, it doesn't. He does eat the Ice Blast in the face though, but he's got enough HP to be able to survive. And Ken Killer, 300 gold with Blink Dagger. Once he gets the Blink Dagger, he's reached that point of no return, but it's going to be very difficult to be a killer. Since Brewmaster still doesn't have a Blink Dagger, your Tinker Hunter doesn't have a Blink Dagger. He wasn't able to kill the Tinker. Also, we actually got Disconnect coming up from only. Probably going to be seeing a pause coming up very shortly. Double D, he wants to get this kill first. Broda pops the Aphonic Shield. There we go, they're backing off, and are we going to be seeing a pause? The there we go, if pause finally comes up from brothers, they realize that only has disconnected. And the Sand King, hey, with that death, he's a bit delayed from his blink dagger, but he's still been getting some great burst strikes in, aside from that level 1 burst strike where he completely whiffed, he's been doing okay. Uh, the Titan, they're opting to max out, only go for 2 points of the Kraken Shell to give you, you go for 2 points of the Kraken Shell to ensure you can always get that Ravage off, since level 1 Kraken Shell, at, and the and laning stage is enough, you need 2 points since it's a 600 HP buff, and once you get level 2, I believe it drops down to uh, 550, so it ensures that you can get the uh, Kraken Shell off. <laughs> it looks like Bambi, or Blink Sucky Sam Samus, he's currently being called, 
Very disappointed in Ghoulies, uh, Brewmaster plays. Brewmaster, 19 minutes in. If you don't have a Blink by the 20 minute mark, I don't know what the hell you're doing. You should be getting the Blink Dagger by the 10, 11 minute mark at the latest, maybe 13 minutes. If you don't get a Blink Dagger, you can't do anything. If you run up towards them, they're going to run the hell the other way. Especially with the high mobility coming up from some of the support heroes. Sankin can, can bar straight into you, can bar straight away from you. Ancient Apparition just runs the hell away. You might be able to catch him up because he's slow, but if there's any supports there, you're wasting time. You can't afford to waste time as a Brewmaster. You have to Blink Clap, then immediately split, and then go commit for the kill, otherwise you don't go for it at all. And because you went for phase drums, this is, an, uh, this is a very old school build that you used to see back when drums was a lot more cost efficient, when it gave you 4 charges but cost about 100 gold less, and back when Brewmaster had, uh, when Blink Dagger cost mana, so Brewmaster needed a stat item if you wanted to go uh, to be the competitor's combo, since you didn't have enough mana to go for a uh, clap to split without investing heavily into stats. Nowadays, with the current meta, you do not do this at all in Brewmaster. It doesn't really give you anything, and this game is a perfect example. Gully had 15 minutes, uh, 19 minutes to be able to kill the tanker before he got this blink dagger. But with that tower kill, he, the tanker's going to get that blink dagger. So he's reached critical mass. You you lost your timing opportunity to be the uh, shut down uh, king killer. Even though they don't get three kills on him, you have to keep killing him over and over again. And not only do you have to kill him, you have to take his towers. You have to take as many towers as possible before he gets his blink dagger. Since once he gets his blink dagger, good luck taking this tower. Good luck taking this tower. Because what he's going to do, he's going to BOT to that tower, blink into here or here, throw out the marching machines, or even here. And every single time the march flies out, it's incredible. It's almost impossible possible for you to push in, as you have no kind of sustain, you don't have the Juggernaut Healing one that can help you sustain the push, you don't, you've got the early mech up, but if you're wasting a mech on the march, you, then the enemy team just comes in and wipes you out, especially since you're also going to be eating the missiles every single time, and the later the game goes, the more powerful our HOR's lineup becomes, and Baden tapers off to an extent, and so does the Sanking, there's a, they, they eventually reaches a point where the Sanking's damage isn't going to be enough because enough of the cores of BKBs, and, or, and because the spoiler is a tanky enough to be able to survive the episode and the pulses, and in Baden, he eventually reaches a point where unless he's obscenely stacked, he just doesn't deal enough damage to be uh, able to kill off the enemy supports, looks like Jamie's blasting music in the meanwhile, and so you, you do have that goal for you in the sense that you've got uh, two very powerful mid game heroes, as well as a Titan. Unless he's able to farm a refresher orb, he does reach a point where he plateaus. But the Tinker, he continues to become more and more powerful. Until Tinker becomes fully 6 slotted, he doesn't plateau. And once he does uh, get 6 items, he's going to kill every single hero on your team. If he goes E Blade to Dagon, that shotgun will instantly kill every single hero on your team, with maybe the exception of Ghoulie. And if Ghoulie's the only one alive, he doesn't really take it, doesn't really give a damn. He blinks out, he waits for your ultimate to wear off, or you even just turn and kill the, br the broodlings. The broodlings alone don't do enough damage. You go for Panda to provide lockdowns, so the rest of your team can do damage. So in this case, Ghoulie's there to set up for a mule as well as Wolfcut, and he's not able to set up because he doesn't have a blink dagger. And so this is the critical uh, moment for game number two. If because he doesn't have a blink dagger, Brewmaster pickup has been completely ineffective. He's got 16 more minutes before Brewmaster reaches his expiration date, and they've only taken one tower. And that was off the back of Ghoulie, of uh, only throwing his life away for that mass open one. So it looks like this is a very long pause coming out. Cats is calling tactical. It looks like they could be having a few issues. 1,500 gold lead, so it still is a very close game. 3,000 EXP lead as well, so the kill lead is very even. So the EXP lead is a critical difference between the two teams. So 1,500 gold isn't really too much of a difference. But the EXP lead is going to be the critical factors. In terms of net worth, you see King Killer as well as the Abaddon leading in terms of CS. Actually, King Killer's tied with Mule, just got one more net worth than him. So Mule's probably not going to be too happy with that. As Mule, he's only taken one death this game. He's been playing fantastically uh, up against the Tink in the mid lane. He, despite losing the early stages because he was uh, because Tink got, got that free wave experience, he's been able to get a lot of kills over in the Tinker and shut him down fairly effectively. They did steal his Ancients. That delayed him, but these exorcisms are used to go for kills as opposed to towers. Exorcisms, it's fine and dandy to get kills using the exorcism, but you have to be able to take a tower afterwards. And so you can push just using the Crypt Swarm. You kill off the Creep Wave and you let your Creep Wave take the tower. So you don't have to commit the exorcism. But because the Death Prophet and the Brewmaster, they're mid game oriented heroes that rely on momentum, because they're not able to find that momentum, and because they're actually behind in experience, which is absolutely critical. As the more experience that gets picked up, if uh, HL Apparitions are ever able to get level 11 very early in the next 5 minutes, or if Sankings able to get level 11 as well, which is actually fairly close to, level 2 Epicenter and level 2 Ice Blast will wreck your entire team. If they get, if 2-3 heroes get caught by the Ice Blast and then the Epicenter, that's game over. 5 IP will immediately get wiped. And so it looks like only, they're not too sure what's happening with him, he's disconnected for a little while. Usually 5 IP, when they play these uh, the group series, they always play together at, as 5 at an internet cafe, it looks like only. Didn't get the memo, he might be playing from home, so we're having a few issues from him. Hopefully he will be joining back in the game. It would be an absolute pity if 5IP get disqualified due to, or if they lose this game as a forfeit, as opposed to only not being a reconnect in. But hopefully he should be reconnecting fairly shortly. UGTFO, he's been shut down 
uh, fairly heavily because he hasn't been farming. He's been rotating. This is what UGTFO loves to do. The instant he gets level 6, or even earlier, he rotates very early because he's able to find these kills and he's able to set up the rest of his teammates. UGTFO, he's the foundation that Horseman of Ruckus rely upon because he's their most consistent player. With maybe the exception of Dumble D, now that he's kind of cleaned up his act and goes BKB now. He used to not go for BKB, so he throw a fair amount of games because of that. Same with King Killer. But TK probably won't be going for BKB in this game until the absolute uh, ultra late game if he absolutely has to, but probably doesn't need to against this lineup. Because the heroes that can lock him down, the Shadow Shaman and the Rubik, he could kill him instantly once he gets the Dagon, uh, once he gets the Dagon, and once he gets the Dagon E Blade, he could, he'll also be able to deal enough damage to uh, the Death Prophet or to the Razor, they won't be able to man fight him. And so UGTFO, that tower is going to be absolutely critical because that gives King Killer his Blink Dagger, it also gives UGTFO his Blink Dagger, and when Titan Attack has a Blink as well as the Tinker, you can't fight against them anymore. It's going to be, you can't push against them because you're always, always uh, walking into March, you're always walking into Missile, and if you ever group up, UGTFO jumps with a Ravage, and if he gets a good 3-4 man Ravage, that, he, they're able to wipe the game off that, because you've also got Epicenter and Ice Blast to set up off it. So Titan are fulfilling a very similar role to the Faceless Void, as his ultimate is being used to set up for his supports. And so the way the current metagame is shifted, this is why you don't see Crystal Maiden, is because A, she's very greedy, is the fact that if you pick up a Crystal Maiden, unless you're playing ultra aggressive, you usually have her rotate through the jungle, and use her Frostbite to uh, farm up creeps and maintain a uh, golden experience, uh, experience parity with the other supports. Otherwise, she doesn't really provide you much. She gives you the macro strategic advantage in, from the mana regen. But when it comes to these team fights, she's never gonna. She's very, it's very rare for a crystal man to be able to get a good freezing field off, just because she's so damn squishy, and because she's never gonna have a blink or a BKB unless her team is obscenely far ahead. In which case, you could have picked any other support and done the exact same thing. So you, the the current meta game fa favors supports that have ultimate durability to synergize with the offlaner, because the offlaner is now being used to set up for the rest of the team. So that's why you see Faces Void picked up as an offlaner. That's why you see Tide Hunter, because these two heroes are guaranteed to be able to provide that setup. You either get a good Ravage off, and Ravage is able to always consistently hit 3-4 heroes because it has such a massive AoE. It covers the entire screen, it sends tentacles flying everywhere. Unless you're able to blink out of that, or unless you're very fast-paced apart, you're always going to be in the back off. Looks like Jamie's actually playing Jolie in the background. It's the Flats National Anthem, it's the Flats Anthem, I don't know why. But, hey, anyway, that being said, Miley Cyrus isn't too bad on that one. And the Faces Void, he's able to set up the Chronosphere. And so a Chronosphere ensures you get a good episode, even if you're only getting on two heroes. If you can kill those two heroes in the Chronosphere, it's worth it. Every time you can get a Chrono and ensure a kill, go for the Chrono, unless it's the Ultra Late Game and you don't have an Agonim Scepter. Those are the only caveats in those cases. Unless you're able to kill a priority target, you want to hold on to your Chronosphere. But in the early mid stage of the game, which is what the meta game currently favors, you want to end, be able to take these decisive actions. And so every single time uh, Faceless Void finds a hero alone with the Chronosphere, uh, from level 6 onwards, up to about the 25-26 minute mark when team fights start to become uh, much more 5 man. If you can catch a single hero and kill them in the Chronosphere, go for it. Because if you kill that hero, your team, the rest of your teammates can follow up and you can take a tower. And the Tide Hunter, he functions in a similar fashion, in the sense that he's much more difficult to bully out of lane than the Faces Void. Faces Void is much more items dependent than the Tide Hunter, but Tide Hunter, he's going to win lane, he's going to decisively win lanes, 1v1 or even 1v3. So that's the advantage. So you lose out the late game potential with the face of, uh, with having Titan as your offlane compared to the face of the Void, but you gain a much more a greater mid game impact. This is Ravage is much more easy and much more reliable to land on multiple heroes in the Chronosphere, and you also get an easier offlane. As Titan Hunter against a soft training, you can actually kill the supports because they can't do anything. If you, once you get two points up the Kraken Shell, they right clicks tickle you, and once you get three, four points on the Anchor Smash, you deal obscene amounts of damage. Anchor Smash deals 225 damage every time you swing it. It's a four second cooldown, and it's got a 400 AoE. So you can reliably hit it on one, two heroes, and it looks like only actually has reconnected. So I haven't given you any issues, but he should be reconnecting fairly soon. And so Titan Hunter, he gives you a much easier uh, early game, but the drawback is he, he starts to taper off late game, unless he's able to get obscenely farmed to pick up a refresher orb. Whereas the Faces Void, he's relevant at all stages of the game, but the drawback to the Faces Void is he has to find farm. If you shut down Ty, Ty can recover by stacking Ancients and by playing them out by stacking neutral creeps, or by going in for kills. Faces Void, he can recover by going for solo pickoffs to the Chronosphere, but if he's really far behind, that's not going to be an option, and he still needs a lot of gold to be effective. As past the 20 minute mark, you, you need items to deal damage now, or you need to be able to provide lockdown for your team, so you either want to have an, go for the Agnum Scepter route, or you want to go for the carry route, or the pseudo carry route, where you pick up something like a BKB or a Maelstrom, where you start building more towards damage than conventional carry items. As if you're able to get level 3 Chronosphere very quickly, you, don't, you shouldn't be going to, for the Agnum Scepter then. Since the uh, twenty, the main reason why you go for the Agnum Scepter is to cool down reduction to 60 seconds, but level 3 Chronosphere has an 80 second cooldown. The advantage of the Agnum Scepter is it does give you a second longer in the Chronosphere, but at that point, you, you'd, be, you'd be better off going for a BKB or going for a damage item, since all you care about with the Chronosphere, it doesn't matter how long it's stuck in the Chronos, so long as you can kill their heroes in the Chronosphere. That's how Faceless Void wins these fights and how he wins the game. 
every time you chrono, you kill whatever hero you chrono. You have, or if you catch multiple heroes, kill the highest priority target. Usually the support hero. If you catch all three heroes, you either go in the carry or you go in the support. If you think you could kill them in the chrono sphere, otherwise you kill their support so their backline's immediately gone. Because with without the backline, and when team fights happen, the carry hero can only do so much. It's very easy to control and lock him down without the backline heroes that back him up. And looks like he's finally reconnected, so we are going to be resuming. I do apologize for the pause, but these things do happen. And they should be able to take that tier 1. That's a very crucial tier 1. Looks like that. Five of you actually looking at the defenders. We've got two TPs coming from Only. Only's going to eat a missile to the face. He catches up Dumbly the Shackle, but he's got borrowed time. He doesn't really care. Clap pops. Borrowed time pops as well. There's no borrow shot. King Killer gets a kill over on Only as he's walking through the march the whole time. You don't ever want to sit and march those robots. They're not full of candy. They're full of damage. Get the hell away from them. Blink Dagger now up on the uh, tanker as well as on the Tide Hunter. And that double blink combination can be very dangerous. And Method Man over on the bot lane. He's controlling the farm. He's not going to point off the course of finale. So it gives him a lot more split push. <laughs> it looks like Lopkan's shit talking his own teammates. He loves to do this. He trash talks everybody. His the enemy team, his own team, himself. Pretty funny guy. But Method Man, uh, he's grouping up. He wants to get that tower lasted since if Sanking gets a blink dagger as well in the next three four minutes, you've got triple blink initiation and counter initiation coming up from Horseman the Ruckus. That means this means they can play very far forward or very far back. Because the tanker, he just hangs back, he can blink in or he can blink out if they jump on him. Abaddon can run up front, because he knows that the, the spot's always going to be able to rotate in. King Kill actually blinks very far aggressively forward, Broder caught out with the bar strike. Method Man says, I'm the only, I'm the only king of the sands, get out of there. And Shadow Pressure Ice Blast completely whiffs, does farm a few creeps, so Gats does get that gold, so hashtag bank was made. Somebody tell Henry. Give Gats his own shirt. Wolf can't, caught up with the Abaddon illusions. They're not, do they proc reverse? Well, wow, they do proc reverse. Okay, so Tyrone gets that last hit. UGTFO, he's a bit jelly of Jamie getting that blink dagger, so he takes a CS from him. Now we have a 20 minute, 40 second blink dagger coming out from an off lane brewmaster that was given a lot of support and a lot of uh, resource investment. This is the latest blink dagger of Ghoulie's life that you should ever be getting. Even though he hasn't died, even though his CS is actually pretty good, this is so exceptionally late blink dagger because you've picked up your blink when the Titan, when the Tinker has his blink and when the Titan has his blink. When you blink on Tinker and go for the clap, if uh, King Killer's fast enough with his reflexes and if he's got his fingers ready, he can actually blink out before you even clap. And so that means that you just put yourself in a bad position. You're forced to commit to the primal split so you don't die. Dumbledore, he gets caught up with the static link. That's the advantage of the raises. You could use him to counter a lot of melee carries. Actually, gets once again very far forward. And he gets a feat to death, another death of the mule. Mule's very happy to farm that up. Call it handicap, call it what you will. He'll take what he, whatever he can get. 1,700 gold up on him. Usually, you see Mule going towards the Bloodstone very early on because he usually has a much more gold. He's usually got about 2,000 more gold than this. But because he's playing from behind, because his team's playing from behind, Bloodstone gives you nothing if you're playing from behind. Unless you're playing here like a Timbersaw. But even then, it's fairly. It's not the greatest item if you're playing really far from behind. And the only reason why it's so crucial in Timbersaw is because that's literally all Timbersaw needs. But with the Death Prophet, there's a multitude of items you could go for. Death Prophet probably wants to be going something towards like a harder Tarrasque for his team. Since. As long as Death Prophet's alive, actually, UGTFO caught up with the Yule Cyclone. He might be forced to commit a defensive Ravage, but no, he's going to tank it like a champ. He knows that he doesn't want to waste the Ravage there, because that gives the enemy team a timing window. And so, not too sure what he was doing there. He could have actually blinked out a bit earlier on, before Yule got in range when he Yule's him up. Kind of sitting there on his own. But while that's happening, space was made as King Killer farming up the Storm. He's got that 600 gold off that Dagon. Once that Dagon comes online, only and Broder have to be incredibly careful. There's enough burst damage to instantly kill Shadow Shaman. And to at least force spread the back, he'll drop it to about 100 HP, but if he eats the Ravage as well, he's dead. And this Rubik, he, he wants to buy a Blink Dagger, but you gotta take towers if you want the Blink. You gotta get, make the money and pay the bills. Especially since the Death Ball, you need a fairly, fairly large amount of it to be effective. And King Killer is gonna farm out the last hit. Sanking, he's got his Blink Dagger now, so you've got triple Blink Initiation, or Counter Initiation coming up from Horseman the Ruckus. Game is becoming very difficult for 5 IP, especially because they have a mid-game momentum-based lineup, and they squandered their early game. Because Ghoulie spent so much time jerking off farming uh, inefficient items, going for the phase of the drum. If he didn't go for the phase boots, if he just stuck with naked boots, and if he didn't go for the drum, he would have had Blink Dagger at 11 minutes. Or even 9 minutes, as he did actually get a fair amount of farm, and he got first blood. And that 9 minute Blink Dagger would have made a complete world of difference. They could have kept killing King Killer over and over. Since Tinker, up against the Brewmaster, Brewmaster gets to clap off at... Even without the split, that's enough to be able to go for a kill attempt and then another hero to back him up. And Tenka now has his blink as his Dagon. So Ghoulie, you can blink on him, but he can blow you up, at least take a good chunk of your life before he he gets on out of there. And Yuji TFO looks like he's on mech duty. Titan is a great mech carrier. Because once he has his blink dagger, he doesn't really need any other. It's nice if you get Shiva's guard or if you get the refresher orb, but it's not essential. I mean the later the game goes, you're gonna be guaranteed to get it in this kind of game. 
or even if even if you don't get the refresher orb, you've got enough damage, enough lockdown coming out from the rest of your team. That first ravage is enough to set up for everybody else. And so Titan, he wants to go for a mechanism because the abandoned shards hasn't gone for it. Dumble D, he's saying I'm playing carry. We'll be interested to see what Amy chooses to go for. I'm I would like to see a sheep stick. I'd be I'd hope for a sheep stick with that ultimate orb, but knowing Dumble D, he'll probably go for something like a Lincoln Spare. Just for the troll build, or oh, you could just be going for a man style the really old fashioned way. But the advantage of Titan going for a mech is he's always going to get it off. It's the reason why Wraith King usually buys a mech if he's playing that 4 position role and nobody else is going for it. Is you can't kill him fast enough or lock him down fast enough for him to not be able to get that mech off. Because with the Titan Hunter, he's got Kraken Shell. He will always get a Ravage and he'll always get a mech off. And so that's a huge factor, especially when you consider if a squishy hero picks up a mech, you usually kill him before he gets the mech off. And you can win a fight off the back of that. Or you doom him if you've got the doom bringer. But with a hero like a Titan with the Kraken Shell, he will always, unless you have a Doom, he will always get off the uh, Ravage as well as the Mech. You Ravage and then Mech, and your teammates are suddenly back in fighting action. And the Wraith King, he's got Reincarnate, so unless you've got a way to control his mana, so if you've got a Nyx Assassin, an Invoker that goes Quas Wex, or the Lion, he's going to be able to reliably get off. Also the Anti-Mage, but Anti-Mage, if it's a one position Wraith King, one position Wraith King actually does very well against the Anti-Mage, because he takes all his towers while the Anti-Mage is farming. But that's another story, the Anti-Mage is actually able to get some sick levels of farm, he also does counteract the uh, Wraith King, since on paper the mana burn is enough to ensure he doesn't get that reincarnate. And every time you don't get a reincarnate, much like a clap, you lose a fight. Missile flies off. Wolfgang actually gets a very good link off. There's a 9 second link. Time is actually able to finish off only the backgrounds. The drawback of the Shadow Shaman, but King Killer gonna be farmed up as looks like Ghoulie's able to get that kill. Radiant Korea flying very far forward. You see if I get a double kill, cycling up into the air. Mule pops his exorcism very late to the party. But they back off there, they might be able to get killed from a huge TFO. Yeah, it looks like he's being lifted up by Broder. Dumble D flies into the apply that falling ship. Unfortunately, it's not clear. Ever it comes up with Methaman, he gets two off the back of that. Great plays coming up from Dumble from uh, Methaman. Dumble D's going to uh, clean up Broder. Broder, no mana. And, and Methaman just stabs him. High Street Vigilante said Method Man, he stabs him in the face. And that's a tattoo tower as well as a uh, 4 for 1. A uh, 4 for 2. They they did lose King Killer, which is a bit of a loss. But they're more than happy to take that, because they get 4 kills as well as a tower. So while 5 IP, they're very happy to take a trade. Because they lost that tower, that trade isn't worth it. And the bottom lane, Gats, doing what he does best, he never seems to be in these fights. He always just hangs back and throws out the Ice Blast. But his Ice Blasts have been fairly on point. He has missed the occasional one. But he's able to land them where it counts. He was able to do it, he instantly popped Shadow Shaman before he got his uh, mass open wards off. And this is the biggest disadvantage of the Shadow Shaman. If you're ahead, or if you're even, Shadow Shaman is fantastic. If you're behind, he is worse than useless, because he's so easy to kill, especially against the Titan Hunter. If he catches him out in Ravage, he's dead. He'll either get Dagon's, or he'll die to the Ice Blast. Wolfgang turns into a pig, then he eats the uh, stun coming out, the Barrow Strike coming out. So there's a Sheep Stick coming out from Dumbled. He's got Borrowed Time, so he's very happy to stand his ground. Wolfgang's able to clean up Gats. Gats once again caught a bit of opposition, but he's blown up by King Killer. The King Killer avenges his flatmate's death. He's now scored up the sides. Barrow Strike comes out from Methanite. He's uh, standing there with, with a Ghoulie whistling the rude. No pops his BKB. He went for early BKB. He should be the kill King Killer, but the match machines are actually going to be enough to be able to kill him off. And Dumbled, he's able to farm him up with the uh, Miscoil. And Ghoulie fleeing for his life. He's got the Bleak. He's got the Bleak. There. But Methanite catches out the Bleak, then uses the Sandstorm. Clap comes out, he turns around and decides the Manfund decides, never mind. Brewmaster's has got the uh, Drunker Broly, really don't want to go for this. Broly turns to a pig, and UGTFO, Jelly of Dumbledee's gain, spits him in the face and kills and steals the kill. And the early sheep stick on the abandoned, I love this pickup because your know, Tinker isn't going to be going for it. He might pick it up once he's finished his uh, Dagon E Blade, but because he's not going for it for now, having a sheep stick on the abandoned is fantastic. Because abandoned, he gets a fair amount. You only, I don't know what the hell he was doing running forward like that, especially against a triple blink. Coming up from uh, also the ruckus, he throws the wards and then he dies and feeds the wards. So this is the drawback of the Shadow Shaman. Once blink, if blinks come online on the enemy team before you get your blink, you are you are completely dead. You uh, you become a complete liability for your team because it's very easy. You're always going to go with the Shadow Shaman because you can kill him very quickly. He's such a squishy hero, and if you could kill him before he gets the mass serpent wards off, you take away a huge amount of five IP's team fight. And so take a quick look at the golden EXP, 12,000 uh, gold lead and rising looks at about 13,000 gold lead and 13,000 EXP lead. Things are looking grim, because you've got a mid game lineup and you lost the mid game. You weren't able to shut down Ken. Ken's reached critical mass, he's got the blink, as well as the Dagon. Level 3 Dagon will be having level 4 Dagon fairly shortly, he's able to do a fair amount of split push. Ghoulie goes in for the kill, but once again, this really does boil down to Ghoulie not being able to get that early blink. The 9 minutes he wasted not being able to get that, uh, getting that 20 minute blank dagger as opposed to the 11 minute blank dagger, meant that they lost the momentum. They lost the initiative because they didn't have an initiator coming out on 5 IP. They're really relying on Ghoulie to be able to get that Blink Dagger. And because by the time he picked it up, Method Man got his Blink Dagger about the same time Ghoulie got his. And so when the 4 position Sand King has actually got almost the same amount of net worth 
As the three position Brewmaster that actually was given a lot of support in the offlane to ensure he could get farm, things are looking very grim. Because face drum Brewmaster, it gives you a lot of stats, it gives you a lot of chasing power, but no one cares about chasing in this, especially with this particular lineup. They're going they're going straight in for kills, they're gonna blink and immediately catch you out with the ravage. They've got a huge amount of burst damage coming out from Horseman the Rock, because they're gonna use that to kill you before you can react to start a fight 4v5 or even 3v5. And the Shadow Shaman pickup would have done a lot of work if they were able to get that blink ticker up on Ghoulie, because that way Ghoulie could jump in and force the enemy team to back away. When uh, Pandaria and Brewmaster blinks and get the clap off and splits, you run. You don't stand a fight because you can't. And the first 20 minutes of the game, you have to run every time he gets a good uh, clap split off. Simply because he'll cycle in the heroes, the core heroes, so he'll cycle up the carrier, or he'll cycle up the hero with the mech carrier, the mech carrier and to ensure that you don't have that uh, reliable, either reliable damage or the reliable uh, heal or utility. And then you stun lock the, the squishiest target and go for the kill, the highest priority target. So in this case, it'd be a, a King Killer over on the Tinker. And the Paddin, Sacred Relic up on him, he might actually be going for a Divine Ray Pair just for the throws, or he could be going for a Radiance just for shits and gigs. In theory, it's a good item because it forces you to have to respond to the Abandon because you're constantly eating the burn damage. In practice, Abandon usually doesn't get enough farm to be the farm of Radiance in good amount of time, so you want to get Radiance fairly early on. And if you just rush a Radiance, you're not going to be survival. You're, actually, Abandon actually is fairly survival to borrow time, so it's not a bad pickup on him. Just very expensive. Ice Blast catches out on two only if he eats the... And Dumbledore just runs over the only because he knows that he could kill him. Mass Simmons drops Ravage Flies out only to die to one more tick of damage. He spits him in the face. Mule pops his PKB, but he's only at 20% HP. Huge TFO, he backs away. Great! So uh, Bar Strike epic coming out from a uh, method man. He stands something up in the trees to be able to deal a bit more damage. Can't get let us take a fall once again. He's always going to be a sacrificial lamb for his team because a lot of hatred's flying out from 5 IP. And Gats, once you get caught out the stud, always seems to be a little bit too far forward. Method man hanging by the back line because he's got the blade. Gats, guys, caught out. He actually might be dying in the mass open ones. Earn just barely keeping himself alive. Method man takes a fall. His brother's able to zip him up. And they're going for it on the hunt. Use your TFO. You cycle on up. Double D decides to stand his ground because he knows he's got borrow time off cooldown. He shields his TFO this time. He's got the sheep stick, so he can actually turn around for a kill over Umbrota. If he decides to go for it, there we go. Ghost for kill Umbrota. So only onto sheep stick. You decide to use the sheep stick. Use your sheep stick. Double D, please. Never the money. That's a right clicks down mule. Ghoulie now turns. There we go. Ghoulie was turned into a pig. Ghoulie wants to go for the blink, but Gats is down to the right clicks. And Double D turns around for a triple call off the back of that borrow time. He's got the 40 second cooldown now. It's level 3. He's going to deal a bit of chip damage. And things are looking very grim for 5 IP. They might be tapping out fairly soon. 17,000 gold lead in their favor and 17,000 EXP lead. The Horseman of the Ruckus might actually be going undefeated into the round of 8. So into the next stage of the ODL too. So fantastic performance coming up from there. Now the roster's been looking... The squad's looking a lot stronger. Now they're playing a bit more conservatively and now they've been switching things up a bit. Only turns around, turns somebody into a pig, but he gets taken off. He really hasn't been able to do much for his team this game. Which is a bit unfortunate because they really were banking on the Shadow Shaman, but that being said, it's not necessarily just the Shadow Shaman's fault. He did go for a few critical pickoffs. It's just the fact that Ghoulie had took such a long time to go for the Blink Tiger, and so they, they didn't have any Blink Initiation. And when you don't have Blink Initiation against a team with a Tide, and with a team with a Tide that's able to get a Blink much faster than you can, and against the Tinker, you ha if you don't have a Blink, you're immediately going to lose the game, just because if they have to position themselves properly, you can't go on the Tinker, because he's always going to Blink out. And if you group up to go for a Tower Push, you just TFO gets up in your grill, and he ravages your face. Dumble D now picks up a Cranium Basher. Good pick up over on the Abandon. So he actually went for the Abyssal Blade, choosing to pick up the Sacred Relic first. It's a bit of an interesting build order, but the uh, Basher works very- the Abyssal Blade works fantastically with the Abandon, because it gives you a huge increase in damage, which is the only thing he lacks. So he has very fast attack speed with the Curse of Avernus, and he's got excellent time on target because he moves so damn fast. With the movement speed he gets from the Curse of Avernus, as well as the Snare that it provides, and the Phase Drums movement speed. So that looks like a level 4, level 5 Dagon. Yeah, level 5 Dagon up on the tanker. So he's going to start farming up towards his E-Blade. Usually, the most efficient build is, or the most more safer and conservative build, is you go Dagon 1 into the E-Blade. Because the Ghost Scepter makes it much more difficult for them to gank you, especially when you've got a Blink Dagon online. Since you can activate the Ghost Scepter, rearm and blink out, they don't have any kind of uh, magic damage to be able to interrupt you. But the, the, the disadvantage of that is it's 5,100 gold before you get you reach your full burst damage potential. Whereas upgrading the Dagon simply gives you a huge increase in damage. So if, when you're ahead like this, and when they've got squishy support, Broda takes a huge amount of damage. If he didn't have that Aphotic Shield, might have actually died to that combo. Ghouli blinks in, catches out, uh, he actually gets turned to a pig. This is the issue with uh, double deep picking up a sheep stick. You can't go like that, you have to clap. You have to split before you clap. Neil pops me, give me once again. He's taking a lot of damage. Double D doesn't give a damn. The Abyssal Blade stun locks him in the face. Wolf can't go for a kill over on uh, UGT FO, but Double D's gonna be able to smash him around. He still has a pop borrow time. And Method Man, great blink, uh, Epi's in the bar strike coming up from him. 
And that's going to be a tier 3 in the center. And the first of the racks going in favor of Horseman the Ruckus. Ghoulie's brought back so he can get that split off. But if you split without your teammates, especially since he's going towards the Aghanim Scepter as well, you're not going to be able to do anything. The Aghanim Scepter is a huge mistake from Brewmaster. So you go for an Aghanim Scepter if you can get it by the 20 minute mark. So if you go the conventional build, so. Arcane Boots, Blink, and then you get a whole bunch of kills and you get to take a bunch of towers because you're a goddamn brewmaster that's got split, they're not going to be able to win these fights if you play effectively. That, then you go for an Aghanim Scepter because it gives you a huge increase in your burst damage. You get double clap, which is absolutely huge. 600 magic damage and an AoE on 2-3 heroes, that'll do a lot, and why do I say that? Double D, just diving like a boss. Tommy, please, it looks like he's actually duking out with Ghoulie, but Ghoulie with the Drunken Haze. There we go, the Drunken Haze has been uh, taken off with the Aphonic Shield, catching out the Abyssal Blade, so he's got two stuns up available on him. 2 seconds done from the Abyssal Blade, the 3.5 second Hex. Ghoulie pops split defensively. Ghoulie, please, go back to playing Weaver. Mid tier 3 tower takes the ball as Ancient Apparition is able to farm it up. And Method Man, he's going for the objective. The rest of his team's fucking around, going for kills. But he knows what's important, the Rex. Actually, now he's going for creeps, but there we go. King Killers blink back. Go step to up on him, so you can't go for a kill up on him. Against him. Wolf God, doing what he does best, trash talking. BKB up on him. So the BKB doesn't really get a lot of uh, tight end to it, as well as the Ancient Apparitions combo, but UGTFO has been fantastic, they've been fantastic with the coordination. Ice Blast and Ravage seem to go at the exact same time, and so even if Mule gets his BKB, he's really lost so much life, that it's not worth it. He's just going to die to a few more right clicks. Because you've got the burst damage combination coming out, while I say that, Goalie turned into a pig once again, eats the Dagon, Dumbledore turned into a chicken, he's got Borrowed Time, there, and he's got the Abyssal Blade. He, Goalie's just, only just making him mad, he doesn't really, he's actually two shots in, with a few right clicks and the gush on top of that. Got a BKB reportedly coming out from Gats. Dumbledore can choose to dive because he's got a, a borrowed time available. And it looks like 5 IP. They're sinking. Broder and Wolfgang, the two brothers, they're fleeing the sinking. They're rats fleeing from the sinking ship. G no GG being called. They're, digging, they're dragging out to the very end. Method Man has a Shiva's guard. So a house stock. <laughs> Gats actually spots out Broder. He throws out the ice blast. Broder actually lifts him up. Wolfgang, he's going to get that 1v1 they want. I guess it's a 2v1. But Jamie's there. Catches out two with the bar strike, never mind, he only catches- Yeah, there we go, saves Gats' life, Brody gets blown up by that combo. Everything that flies out, Wolfcut, he really wants that kill. Brody's saying come back, and Method Man, he's got that blink tank, he can choose to go on Wolfcut if he really wants to, because he knows the stack link's avail oh, not available, misses the bar strike, but Wolfcut is very fast. Turns around on Gats, Gats uses the cold feeble, so Wolfcut's gonna run very far forward to ensure that doesn't happen, he says hey, he again, pops the BKB, should be the kill off Gats, hopefully. He's got plasma field, he doesn't have money to use it. There we go, one more right click and he gets a kill on Gats. But while that's happening, Dumbledore and UGTFO is styling on the enemy team. Dumbledore, he's got Borrowed Time, he doesn't really care action, might die before he gets it off Dumbledore. Borrowed Time is guaranteed to come off unless you're doomed. Only he's just making him angry and he bashes him in the face. And Dumbledore just swaggers on out there. GG well played, finally being called. Looks like Horseman Ruckus were able to 205 IP. And on a scale of 1 to TI4, pretty anticlimactic. Was expecting 5 IP to at least drag it out to game number 3, but Horseman and the Ruckus, they were able to play absolutely fantastic. Minus Jamie, but hey, he was able to get a few good Burrow Strikes off later on in the game. So that looks like it for tonight. I believe uh, Sing 2 might actually be playing a series right now. If they still are playing, I'll, I'll commentate on the games. Otherwise, that should be it for tonight. So stay tuned for more, but that'll be all.